Friends, let us bow our heads in prayer. Loving God, you meet us here and we meet you. Give us an awareness of the presence of the holy around us and the sacred within us, that we might worship you with our whole being. In Christ we pray. Amen. Good morning, and I invite you to join me in the call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. As we gather on this holy day, we hope to be more aware of and to connect with God. We ask for openness so we might be aware of the sacred around us. We hope for a fresh indwelling of the spirit that we might fully worship God.
Please be seated. We gather in this holy place that we might know and understand God better. Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship at Bradley Hills Presbyterian Church. It is a joy and a privilege to gather with each and every one of you here today to worship our Lord. Whether we're here in the sanctuary or part of our far-flung family throughout the world that's gathered through the gift of technology and the Spirit. We're grateful for part of that far-flung family here in the sanctuary with us. The Silkies here from our Florida contingent, Donald and Phyllis Sutherland here, as Donald is honored at an organ concert, among other things, in the days to come, and, and others who've gathered here from different states who I see around in this place. If you're newer to our community, we'd love to have a chance to get to know you more and to connect and share the ministries of the church. We, we have a welcome visitor packet in, for our guests in our narthex, and I'm going to be gathered following worship today for anyone who would like to learn more about Bradley Hills or get more connected or, or perhaps even explore membership. We're going to be gathered for the next three weeks, including today at uh, following worship in Covenant Hall, right through where coffee hour is today. Uh, to, to share about the ministries of the church. And there's a Zoom link as well for those who might be wanting to join online. You'll see in your bulletin or online announcements of the life of our community. Certainly online, you can open up that bulletin and make a pledge or a gift and open up a children's bulletin if you like. A lot going on in the life of our community here in the, the month that October is. We, we first of all, today is a special day at three o'clock uh, today. We are going to give thanks to God for the gifts uh, that Matt Nabinger brings as he is ordained a minister of word and sacrament here in this sanctuary at three o'clock this afternoon, and we invite you to join us for that celebration. Following worship today is our Smart Sacks ministry as we seek to pair worship and service each week, feeding those in need in Montgomery County. Down in our lounge is that program today. Our Feeding Families program gets going October 21st, and you'll see uh, these, these uh, brochures, these flyers in the church for our authors among us, our interfaith gathering uh, on Zoom this Tuesday night, uh, our third of our authors among us, different authors uh, among ourselves and Bradley Hills, BJC, uh, MIC, our interfaith partners, um, are going to talk about their books. And so that will be Tuesday, and you'll see those flyers throughout the church. Bible study gets going on Wednesday. Bob Dean's We'll be providing adult education next week. Our new cherub choir for our youngest singers. Our third children's choir gets going uh, next week on the 15th. Uh, we still, as our children's programs continue to grow, need three more volunteers for our children's programs as well. Our Bradley Hills Presents concert on the 22nd and other activities in the life of our community. We invite you to take home the bulletin and explore those uh, as you can. As we continue to join in our interfaith witness here, we've been in touch with BJC closely around the violence in the Holy Land this weekend. And so as we get to our prayer portion of our service later today, we will join uh, with BJC and our other partners throughout the world, but also near at home in praying for peace. That is the prayer that BJC has asked us to lift up for Israel, for all the Holy Land, and so we'll pray for peace later in the service certainly today. But as we gather today, we are aware not just of the challenges of the world, but of the opportunity that God gives us to be aware of the presence of the Lord. We do so in particular this season in different ways of giving of our gifts. God has given to us of time and talent and treasure and to share those. And so at this time, I would invite the opportunity to hear a minute for ministry with you. Penny Clark is here, and I'd invite her to come forward and to share a minute for ministry as we think about the calling we have in this time of year. Penny? I've been a member of Bradley Hills Church since 1996. Um, it's, um, it's been a wonderful time for me coming to love this building, the beautiful grounds around us. It's formed wonderful memories for us. Um, I, the memory of my daughter's baptism, of 
one daughter being married here in the sanctuary with David performing the ceremony, Matthew providing the music on the organ. Um, of the day in 2002 when one of my daughters took me by the hand and practically dragged me to the choir loft after the service saying, you have to come sing in the choir. Well, here I am, um, still now, all these years later. Um, from the entire, I mean, the entire time that I've been a member, uh, I have been pledging the amount of money that I expect to be able to give in the coming year. This, as you've no doubt discovered, is pledge season when we on the Stewardship Lay Ministry uh, invite you and encourage you to tell the church how much you can give next year and then to faithfully keep that pledge. Um, as a member of the Stewardship Lay Ministry for the last couple of years, I've learned how important it is for the finance lay ministry and session to know how much they can expect in income in the coming year so that they can decide how much they can pay the pastor, the music director, how much they can pay our other faithful employees who keep this enterprise running, um, how much they can spend for missions the things that we do to help our neighbors both near and around the world, um, how much can be spent to repair the building when it needs repairs. Um, all of these things are very important, and I would encourage you prayerfully to consider how much you can pledge. Um, ideally, we each pledge a little bit more every year, uh, every little additional amount helps in order to fund the budget of the church, to make it possible for us to continue the mission that means so much to each of us individually. Thank you. Would you please join me in the prayer of adoration and confession as found in your bulletin, followed by your own uh, prayers of confession in silence. Lord, our God, you call us to live the gospel, but we remain silent. You call us to be reconciled to you and one another, but we are separated. You call us to seek the good of all, but we too often live for ourselves. Forgive us, O Lord. Give us the courage and strength to be reconciled to you and others. We pray through Jesus Christ as we confess. Believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
You may be seated. Good morning, good morning everyone, good morning children, especially good morning to you. Today is a really special day for me because this afternoon I am going to be ordained as a pastor. And I wanted to tell you during our children's time a little bit about something called ordination. Can you say ordination? Very good. Well, to talk about ordination, we have to talk about something else first before we can really talk about ordination. And the something else we have to talk about first is called a call. Can you say call? Not a phone call. Not calling across the room to your friend. A call from God. And a call from God is not really something you can hear with your ears. Often, a call from God is something that you just know deep down inside. And you might have some doubts. You might not always be sure, but it's there. Everyone has a call from God. Even you, you have a call from God. And your call from God tells you what you're supposed to do, what your work is supposed to be. Jesus had a call from God. Jesus' call from God was to come close to people, especially the people that nobody else wanted to come close to. And when Jesus obeyed God's call, it changed the whole world. Just like God had a call for Jesus, God calls to you. Even if you don't know what a call is yet, even if you don't understand what it is yet, you do have one. Even if you can't hear what God is saying yet, that's okay. You do have a call. You don't have to be a, a grown-up to start listening for God's call. You can start listening for God's call right now. We listen for God's call when we pray, or when we read the Bible or hear stories from the Bible at home or at church, we listen. Yeah, you do that. We listen for God's call when we are still and silent. And I wonder what God's call could be for you. God has a call for everyone. Even if you don't know what yours is yet, you do have one. So now I can tell you about ordination. Ordination is a certain type of call from God. Sometimes God calls people to have special leadership positions in the church, like a pastor. And when God calls someone to be a pastor, the church ordains them. There's a big ceremony. The, the person being ordained answers questions and makes promises. All the other pastors say special prayers for the person being ordained. And at the end of the ceremony, everybody knows this person is a pastor now. And I will be a pastor this afternoon. I will be ordained as a pastor this afternoon. When I was your age, I didn't know God was calling me to be a pastor. I had no idea. But as I listened for God, God helped me to hear that call. I wonder if any of you might be called to be ordained one day. Maybe you could be a pastor one day. You might, maybe you'll give great sermons like Pastor David or Pastor Denise. Maybe you'll visit people who are sick. You'll help make decisions for the church. Or maybe there's a different call for you. Maybe God's call for you is to take care of animals. Or be like a nurse who comes close to people who are sick and takes care of them. Maybe. Or, or maybe God's call for you is to sing beautiful music and help people come closer to God. You have a call from God. So what I want you to remember from our children's time today is that God calls all of us to help heal the world. Everyone has a calling that only they can do, even you. If you don't know what your call is today, that's okay. You don't have to worry about that. But I wonder how you could listen and find out what God wants to tell you. Let's pray together. Ready? Repeat after me. Loving God, thank you for calling us. 
to be your people. Help us to listen. Help us to know what you call us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, go in peace. Our first, our first scripture lesson comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 22, verse 6. And this is a, a saying that I'm sure almost everyone in here is very familiar with. Listen to these words. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we come to worship, we seek an awareness of God in our head, in our heart, in our soul. Hear these words now as we continue to explore and mine what the book of Proverbs has to say about that gift of holy wisdom for our living. The Pew Bible's version of what Denise had just read from Proverbs 22, train children in the right way, and when old they will not stray. From Proverbs 1, which has animated our sermon series this fall, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. 
From Proverbs 18, friends play at friendship, but a true friend sticks closer than a sibling. And from Proverbs 4, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze straight before you. Keep straight the path of your feet and all your ways will be sure. This is the word of the Lord. As we continue to think about the book of Proverbs there, Denise is certainly right. That phrase from Proverbs 22 that we hear, to teach children in the right ways, and when they are old, they will not stray. It's a well-known proverb. It is one of a series on an adult talking to a child and on parenting. A little more popular uh, than thinking about spare the rod and spoil the child, which derives loosely from Proverbs 13, or the idea of a, of a wise son being one who harvests in the summer from Proverbs 10. There are several parts to the book of Proverbs. That central section from chapter 10 to roughly chapter 22, 16, probably advice that was given potentially in a court or to to someone who might be in a royal situation one day about how to live, but it applies to all of us. Those phrases in that central section there are usually two phrases, not necessarily connected to the Proverbs before or after them, but but tend to, to play off of each other. You can raise a child when they are young, and when they're old, this happens, or wisdom comes this way, but folly comes another way, or you're to do this in order to avoid that. There are two phrases in most of the Proverbs which tend to relate to one another. Here we come today in Proverbs 22 to a well-known phrase that has become for many something that is proverbial. In our culture, we talk about things that are proverbial, like the proverbial, it sticks out like the proverbial sore thumb, right? proverbial, proverbs, those short sayings which can provide wisdom for our living. And Indeed, as we seek an awareness of God, the ones that we've heard today might just be able to do. And so let us pray. Loving God, we come seeking a glimpse of you. May this gift of wisdom how to make good decisions with the knowledge that we have in the time that has been given to us. Allow us to recognize that wisdom is a holy gift, that by seeking an awareness of you, we might live with it. In Christ we pray. Amen. Most summers in the first week of August, our family finds ourselves in upstate New York, it's been that way since I was little, and, and for the last several decades, really, part of that first week involves me on a sunfish on Lake George. Sunfish is a boat roughly 14 feet long, as far as I can tell, usually sailed by casual sailors like myself, but, but one day in August of 22, I was a little bit too casual in my sailing. People who know a lot more about sailing than I do say Lake George is usually a pretty good place because it's, it's not too, too big and the wind is usually relatively consistent. As I was heading out one day there, I got going and I was losing myself in the moment and before long I finally realized that I was heading out in one direction while all the other boats were going in a different direction. I hadn't checked the weather report before I started sailing, and the wind started picking up, and with it the waves, and pretty soon I found myself kind of alone out in the lake. I started at that point to decide, well, maybe I should head back as well, and as I started to turn the boat around, the wind caught me and knocked the boat over. I was wearing a life jacket. I was bobbing up and down in the middle of the lake. I held on to the to the boat and eventually was able to ride it back up, but when I got in, I was unable to sail it. The sail seemed fine, the dagger board was in, the 
ropes seemed to be strong. I couldn't figure out why I couldn't sail the boat. But there I was with this strong wind being pushed parallel to the shore, but further and further away from the boathouse. As I began to get further and further away, I was a little bit afraid. I was fortunate that a fisherman and his son, who were in a motorboat, who were heading back home, saw me there and had a cell phone and were able to call in for help, and I was eventually pulled in. But as I sat in that boat, as I reflected later, I I had sort of two general thoughts in my mind. The first was I was kicking myself at my own hubris, my inability to recognize the moment around me and to respect the wind and the waves as I should have recognized as they grew that I should change course earlier. That phrase from the proverb one, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom, is certainly true. Fear of the Lord has different parts to it. One of it has to do with respect for God and the creation. The creator certainly is much bigger than we are, but so are the natural forces all around us. As one commentator in an NPR report on Yosemite a few weeks ago put it, Mother Nature always bats last. With the World Series this month, that's a wonderful baseball analogy of the last word being coming not from us, but from the Creator or the natural forces around us. They are to be respected, and and I ended up afraid because I did not have a proper amount of fear of the Lord. But another part of fear of the Lord is an awareness, not just that God is present in forces that we can't control, but that we are part of creation too. And therefore, respect for an awareness of God means respecting a God who is intimately related to us and near to us as well. And so at the moment that I was floating, unable to steer the boat, I began to recite to myself some psalms. That is typically my default in moments of anxiety. They've served me well in moments of of medical challenge. They've served me well in moments of anxiety in life. One of you shared with me this week that you're reading the memoirs of Cardinal Joseph Menzetzi, who was Uh, in the post-World War II period, a cardinal in Hungary who was jailed by the communists for his activities. Zetsi writes that what helped sustain him during his years in prison was reading psalms over and over again until they lined his soul. I love that phrase of psalms that lined the soul. It should not surprise us that the bookends of the Psalms include wisdom literature. Job, the great example of suffering in the Bible, precedes the Psalms, and the phrase, the fear of the Lord, is in Proverbs 1, which is the very chapter that follows the last page of the Psalms. It points to an awareness of God within us as part of the creation. As we think about raising up children, or disciples at any point in life's journey, in a way we should go so that we will not lose our way, what could be more fundamental than this concept of a fear of the Lord? Both a respect for Mother Nature, certainly for young people who are going to to need, as we all do, to confront climate change and the importance of recognizing our inner relationship with the rest of creation. Respect is critical. And then whether it's a psalm that lines the soul or another way in which we are aware of God, being recognizing the awareness of God as part of the fear of the Lord will serve each of us well in moments when fear takes on reality for us. I was reading about what happened to a bunch of parrots in August of 2021 the other day at the Lincolnshire Central Zoo in England. The zoo had imported over 200 African gray parrots, and the problem was that five of them were together and could not stop uttering curse words at all of those who were visiting the zoo. 
The zookeeper said, well, it's not unusual to have a single parrot that utters curse words. After all, parrots tend to end up on pirate ships, it seems. But to, to have five of them together that couldn't stop uttering curse words was, seemed unusual and problematic. They had to separate the parrots, the zookeeper said, because they continued to ruffle feathers with the parents. And it was a recognition of one of the great cultural proverbs of our time. The proverbial birds of a feather flock together. Because the zookeepers decided that one of these started uttering curse words and the other ones started uttering them too, that, that they were all influenced by but whatever bad apple was first in the flock. Our proverbs would say that some people play at friendship but others can stick true. Those who are around us can influence our behavior, right? This is why the church and all of its imperfections can be so important. That when Penny lifts up the minute for ministry, how personal a relationship with a church in its many ways can be with her, even for her daughter suggesting that she join the choir, it is, it is through the influences of others who are around us in the community that we are shaped in our discipleship, whether they are older than us or whether they are children. The friendships that we have here at Bradley Hills I know sustain many of you. I've seen the way that played out on Thursday as so many of us gathered for BJC member Marty Ganglass's funeral, the ways in which folks here have gathered in these past weeks to try and prepare for the ordination that Matt talked about that will be this afternoon, or as many of you have walked journeys culminating in the funerals that we'll have over the next week for Lois Johnson and, and Lori Kotchenruther. Birds of a feather do flock together, and as we seek to experience an awareness of God, I know for many of you how much seeing the face of God in the presence of another matters. It's why at Adult Ed today we help conclude that a, a good life is found not in isolation so much, but in relationship with another human being. And so I invite you during this season to experience an awareness of the holy in relationship with a friend. This is why Jesus eventually said to his disciples, I no longer call you that, I, I now call you friends. Because they grew in such relationship that the sacred could be seen in someone else. I think we also seek to help those who are young and those who are young at heart grow in the way of the Lord through the concept of seeking to have our gaze or our focus or our steps on the path that is right in front of us. Because there's an invitation in the Proverbs to focus not just on doing the right thing, that is part of what wisdom certainly seeks to help us do, but also to have a focus on an awareness of God with us each step of the way. I was reminded of the importance of focus this week as I kept reading the news story about Sam Bankman Freed, the trial of this 31-year-old cryptocurrency trader who seems to have lost $8 billion through his company. And one of the things that was so interesting to me about reading about Bankman Freed was the news reports about how some red flags should have surfaced from those who were lending him money because of his lack of focus. The Bankman Freed had this propensity to continue to play video games during important meetings. They'd be sitting in meetings and he would have this computer next to him or a handheld device and continue to play a game called League of Legends during important meetings that he played the video game during his own lecture at the Chicago Economic Forum, that while pitching Sequoia Capital for billions of dollars of venture capital, during his own pitch, he continued to play the video game. That perhaps in the age of what Thomas Friedman calls an age of distraction through electronics, that there is wisdom to be found in focus. That is why fear of the Lord seeks to help us to be aware that there is holiness even in the small moments, but that can be experienced most when we are calm and not distracted. And so the sacred moments of music that we experience in worship or the depth of prayer 
that we go through in our concerns and celebrations help to try to calm us to allow a focus of the awareness of holiness in an age of distraction. You know that word for way, by the way, in the Hebrew, derek, literally means something that is appropriate for its station. That part of the, the book of Proverbs that is instruction for someone who might well find themselves in a royal court, a particular kind of station. But it should not surprise us, as, as one of you pointed out to me recently, that our, our main scripture about training a child in the way they should go and when they are old they shall not stray, that, that word, when they are old they will not stray, does not imply a straight path. Right? It doesn't say when they're a teenager they won't stray, or when they're a young adult they won't make a different decision. It says when they're old they will not stray. It is a recognition that life's journey is not necessarily a straight line. And so it requires an awareness of God to do what we cannot do for ourselves in terms of focus. I certainly know that from my own experience in sacred spaces. I spent much of my childhood on Sunday morning sitting with my parents in pews and I would fill out as about as many visitor cards as I could find in the pew in front of me with all sorts of pictures and doodles, pretending not to pay any attention. And here I am. And by the way, I know well from spending much of anxious moments during my 20s sitting praying in that very same sanctuary where I did all those doodles. The example that you set as parents and grandparents for others who will follow in the church and in life matters even if we don't think the person is paying attention, that they are too distracted to notice what you're doing. It does matter. And this is why, as we think about our Proverbs, that fear of the Lord or importance of friendship or a focus on trying to be aware of the holy can make a great difference in our awareness of what really is pushing us along. And so in August of 22, when I made my way finally back to the boathouse and started to talk to some who were much wiser in sailing than I was about why I couldn't steer the sunfish, I I learned that the problem was that the rudder wasn't down properly. When I capsized the boat here, when you you re-put the boat back up, you've got to make sure everything is is jiggered the right way, and I just didn't get the rudder down, the thing that helps steer it from the back in the correct format. And so I would try to move the ropes in the right way, but without the rudder that was there to help steer the boat, it drifted in a way I did not intend to go. There are certainly times in life when something dramatic happens. We wake up to a news report of incredible violence in the Holy Land or something traumatic happens in our own life and and we need psalms to line our soul. But there are other times when we just are drifting. We don't know really what's going on or why and we turn around one day and we realize that we're off by ourselves. And those friends that can help keep us focused are far away. And is there where the habit of an awareness of God at any moment can make the greatest difference? So we gather each week to reinforce that in our souls. And so this past summer, on the very first time that I went sailing, you better be sure that when I rigged up the boat, I made sure the rudder was on and down in place. Made sure that it was right and true, and I spent an extra moment looking at it for just a second as an awareness that what's behind you to push you along that you might not be able to see but can help steer can make all the difference. So as we gather today, we recognize that an awareness of a God who who makes us in that God's image is key. That the one who comes, Jesus Christ, as our guide to call disciples like us as friends will walk alongside us. And that the one that is pushing us from behind may indeed be the spirit of an almighty God. And so let us pray.
Loving God, help us this day to be aware of you. Allow us to keep our eyes fixed on your Son who guides us and gift us with your Spirit, a spirit of gentleness, a spirit of restlessness. Stir us from our placidness, wind, spirit, wind on the sea. Amen.
Would you please join me in the response to faith uh, from the brief statement of faith which is printed in your bulletin? In life and in death, we belong to God through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. We trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. Friends, it's time for us to um, show our appreciation and, and give back. Our God is a generous God who offers us unfailing love and faithfulness. So in love and gratitude for God's gifts to us, we return our gifts and our offerings to be a blessing to others. May the ushers please come forward to receive our gifts.
And this is a time that we uh, come and we can share our joys as well as our concerns with one another. And so at this time, I would like to um, offer the opportunity, whether in silence you do so, but those of you who would like to lift up for, um, for the congregation out loud to offer prayers for your concerns or your joys may do so at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. So prayers of celebration. Um, so with Thanksgiving, we praise the Lord. And then also for um, the complications, but Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yeah. Prayers for Andy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Please join me in prayer. Precious God, we just come to you always grateful to be able to gather together, gather in person, um, as well as to gather through technology. We thank you for this day. We know that this is the day that you have made, and while we have things that we have many concerns about, that we know that you are present to us through all of it. We thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, just as we have joys, the joy of Matt, who has been with us for several years, doing wonderful work with our children and our youth, Lord, we just give praise and thanks that he has heard your call and will be ordained today. And so we celebrate that. As you call us through um, to share our joys in, with one another, marriages and births. We give thanks that um, for the, the births of new babies in the congregation, um, that baby Elijah um, was born not too long ago, and so we welcome him to our community. We know that you give us green pastures and that you give us still waters. And then there are the valleys, valleys that we seem to feel that we feel too often these days. And so we ask that you be with those who have loss and grief within their family, the families of Lois Johnson, the family of Lori Kachenruther, and the family of Melissa West. And those who, whose bodies um, are frail and, and are diseased, but Lord, we know that you can lay your healing hands on them to give them comfort, to give them strength as they go through treatments. And so we offer prayers for Sharon and for Peg. We offer prayers for Melinda and for Andy, for Bob and for Chuck and for Kay. And those who have been unnamed, you know who they are even as we uh, hold them in our hearts. And so most of all, what faces us today is the news from yesterday, Lord, and we just, um, we know that we continue to hear about the unrest and the, the, un, the violence around the world and just surprises where we are not being neighbors with one another as you've called us to do. And so we pray for, we pray for, what is happening in the Middle East. We pray for those families who have lost loved ones. And so we pray that um, the, the peace that, um, that we know that can exist in you, that that peace comes, a true shalom, the total well-being of all concerned. 
And so we ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we know, Bradley Hills is not just a building, it is a body, the body of Christ. You don't just go to church, you friends are the church. And so, while our worship has ended, our service has just begun. As you go forward to serve thee whom we adore, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the author of all wisdom, and the fellowship and friendship of the Holy Spirit, carry you this day and always. And together may the people of God say, Amen. Please be seated.
friends, let us find a way this day to share the peace of Christ with someone else. May the peace of Christ be with you. And go in peace.